We are proudly supported by American Express. Did you know that American Express card members can earn points when they tap on Square and that Square sellers pay one low rate to accept the card? If you're a Square seller, you can let your customers know that your business supports American Express payments with complimentary signage and supplies at amexpop.com slash square. Yeah, I remember like talking to the team that night, I cried. <laughs> Like, I yeah, cried in front of them. The idea that we, what we increase our prices and then obviously all I think about is no one will come to us anymore. We made so many mistakes that we're always going to make. Don't let Lorenzo measure the store. <laughs> A lot of them were terrified that the business would fail within six months. They said that in those words. They were like, you will not survive six months. And you have to try it. You have to just roll the dice. I think you have to take those risks. This is Cool Room Confessional, a podcast by Square. In this series, we're offering hospo business owners a place to confess their problems. With some expert help, we're going to try and solve them. I'm Melissa Leong. I've been a writer, culinary critic and TV judge. We've got the young guns behind Melbourne business Pastor Prego with us today. Let's meet the boys. Ask almost any Italian Australian and they'll tell you that the heart of their childhood home was the kitchen table, with a steaming bowl of pasta at its centre. And if they're anything like 25-year-old best mates Lorenzo Fantorella and Isaac Verano, they have spent their adulthood in the pursuit of recreating Nonna's favourites. Uh, the Nonna's are harsh critics. The best I got out of my Nonna was not bad, so... But that's, that, that means very good. I think Gordon Ramsay could cook for her and she'd still complain. My mum was always like, oh, you work too hard. Stop working too hard. The business may be built on tradition, but the boys had a very modern start. The nonnas would recognise Isaac and Lorenzo's carbonara, but not the viral TikTok phenomenon that launched Pasta Prego to the masses. Pasta Prego only opened last week and I actually thought it was a sit-in restaurant, but this is way better. I always thought Melbourne needed a good takeaway pasta place and the universe delivered. I really just a customer came in and put up a TikTok of us. Like I think it was because it was organic, it it worked really well. They put up a TikTok and then it got a maybe like a hundred thousand views or something. Check them out, make sure you get the cheesy garlic bread. But this business is no flash in the pan. Pasta Prego has succeeded as a takeaway and casual dine-in pasta vendor because it's met its moment. Post-lockdown, Melbourne diners in a cost-of-living crisis want a casual food option at an affordable price point. We'd focus on fast casual, which is like this almost not a niche, but within like obviously it's like quick service, which is, you know, your Casey's and McDonald's. And then there's restaurants, which are your higher end, like, you know, white tablecloth kind of service. Well, we're just sitting in the middle category there. Number. If an angry customer comes in and goes up to us like, oh, I want to speak to the manager. It's like, oh, he's not in today, but I'll pass on a message. It's clear when you speak to these young men that Pastor Prego's bottom line is the friendship they forged in primary school. Hey, Ted, can I get a garlic in, please? I feel like we structure in a way where there's not really a hierarchy. It's kind of just like everyone like gets along really well and everyone respects each other. Like we, we hate being called like the boss or the managers. Like we're just like workers there you know and like people respect us and we respect them order number 47 the business is thriving a year on from opening its doors in melbourne's chapel street in south yarra expansion is on the co-founders minds thank you so much have a nice night and with growth comes a whole lot of other challenges for any business as much as we know about how a, a store runs we don't know how a franchise runs Pasta Prego co-founders Lorenzo and Isaac are here, boys. Welcome to the table. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. Congratulations on being the cusp of your second storefront. Before we go into that, can you tell us a bit about how you found your first location? So we were looking for like, what, six, nine months. We were really patient. Chapel Street had a bit of opportunity post-COVID especially. Mm -hmm. So it was just a matter of waiting for the right spot and then the site that we picked, I remember it came up on a Friday and I saw it on the Friday night and then Monday morning I was on the phone with the agent and that was that. It was just like this little food hub in, I guess, the middle of Chapel Street, which can be a bit lost, I'd say. Like, right, got so you were thinking, thinking about 
your customers, what their lives are like, where they're going and how you fit into their lives? Yeah, I guess like the concept really just started from like me and like I were well, both being younger, not wanting to cook every night. And like it was just trying to find people like us yeah. and then market it to them and try and fit into their daily routine. So we know that that has been enough of a success, that first build, uh, that you're moving to another location. So what are your challenges? What are the challenges that have come with that contemplation of expansion? I guess what we're trying to do is literally just replicate exactly what we've done at another location that we feel like our target market would be. Literally just replicating it. We made so many mistakes with the first door <laughs> that we're always going to make and like Care to share? Oh. What's the big one? Oh. Don't let Lorenzo measure the store. Yeah, so Lorenzo <laughs> measured the first store when I was in Adelaide and we ordered all our equipment. And then... Okay, there's more backstory the to this. this is, I'm going to get rinsed for this. <laughs> but there is more backstory to this. The equipment rocks up and we have everything. We're like, whoa, where's this going to fit? Anyway, and then we have this freezer that's like right up against the corner. And it's a four-door freezer. And only two doors open because the two other doors are completely covered by another fridge because someone couldn't measure it. We didn't, know <laughs> that go- we didn't know that going into it, so that was our fault. So we're moving into inviting Benji to Carlos to pull up a chair. Benji is the owner of Costas Takeaway, a Sydney sandwich institution that's about to open its fourth venue. Benji, there are a lot of parallels between these businesses, yours and theirs. We're looking at mainly takeaway meals, a similar price point, high quality food that caters to professionals. Given that you're a few steps ahead of the boys, can you tell us what you remember about that process of going from one premises to two, like Pastor Pergo is about to do? It's a roller coaster. It's a wild journey. <laughs> uh, strap in. Biggest challenges for us was obviously very similar to you guys. Moving from one location, we kind of had the same team, set team, everyone knew their job. Moving into the second location, not really thinking much more than like, yeah, it's just going to be the same. Open the second venue and and then it's like, oh shit, we need production. Oh shit, we need to have HR. We need to be hiring at all times. We need to, it, it just turns into this whole different business. You step back and you go, oh, I didn't really plan for any of this. I thought we'd just open and things would just be the same. So, and it was really busy. So first venue is super busy, open the second and it's just, we didn't know what, we kind of were just beside ourselves, like working till every night, prepping, going from one venue to another, borrowing friends' vans. And <laughs> it was, you know, it was, we were just doing what we needed to do to do service the next day, pretty much. Character building. Yeah. Yeah, literally. That's what we call it. <laughs> brining like, half a ton of chicken and yeah. it was it was wild it was wild <laughs> but then obviously we're like okay we need to change what we're doing because this is not sustainable for anyone it, w- it was from working in the business to working on the business which was the biggest biggest change for us and just setting up systems and procedures so you go to you know setting up a head office team setting up your systems and procedures to ordering like are you guys going to have a production kitchen we were planning to have it within our next door and not initially set it up, just waiting for us to slowly pull the trigger on it. I guess that's, yeah. why, we're, that's why we're here mainly, is to yeah. work out the best way for us to systematically set that up. That's going to get us the best bang for our buck. Benji and the boys have another issue to contend with, waste. When they're designing their prep kitchen, they also have to consider the ebbs and flows of ingredients. There are some services that can help with that, Food by us is one of them. Here's Ben Lipschitz. What we've been able to do with these central kitchen concepts is we actually make the central kitchen a ghost supplier. We, we make them operate as a supplier on the network, but we only expose that supplier to the satellite venues. So essentially what you've got is that central kitchen through our software can capture all the different orders that are required for that central kitchen to prep for all of those different venues. And then of course the venues themselves can say, you know, in addition to wanting you know, X, Y, Z from the central kitchen, I also need this alcohol or this seafood or whatever from you know whatever external supplies there are. But what that basically does is the central kitchen can set the minimum order. The central kitchen can set the cutoff time. The central kitchen can tally up all the orders that are coming from all these different venues and basically start to understand, okay, this is what I need to start getting ready and, and by when. And they can also communicate between one another as as if one is a supplier and one is just a general restaurant. And the benefits of that 
uh, as you said, since they're still fiving it out and they're still trying to understand and be flexible and fluid, you get your data in the one space between the two sides, the central kitchen and those satellite venues really quickly, really like instantly, and then you can start to make decisions. And those decisions basically drive profit. What will that central kitchen be mainly used for? Because one thing we found out was the more we can actually do on those, like it's got this great idea, oh, we've got a central kitchen, we'll just make everything there. But what we found out was, okay, let's just work out how much we can actually do on these sites. And the less we can do in the production, like there's certain things you want to do in the production kitchen, there's certain things you don't want to pull everything out of the store because you got to organize logistics, you got to pay yeah. for transport. So yeah, what kind of stuff is going to be done at the production kitchen? For us, the main thing, obviously the logistics for two stores isn't there yet. Mm. But with us, it's mainly about quality control, just mm. making the sauce every day. It's something that if we're not doing it, the person doing it, we want to make sure like, you know, to replicate and get someone to trust multiple times is really hard. It's so that consistency if we that want you're the looking consistent for. Store, and, yeah. Um, yeah. So even between the two stores, you know, the air can be in a different spot. Yeah. which will affect the flames mm. and stuff like that. And yeah. like, you know, the canopy might be stronger at one side than yeah. the other. So it's yeah. like these little things, just some, like, they all yeah. add up and they just change the consistency of the sort. You are way more pedantic probably yeah. about your product than any other customer you would have. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, man, it's really hard. Like what you're talking about now is like stepping away because you know you can't be at two places at once. So yeah. What yeah. the, what, what do we do? Because mm. yeah, they, you guys seem very passionate like myself and you know, you got these operators that, are very used to treating it like a corporate kind of setup and very business. This is how we do it. The hardest thing for me was actually stepping out of working in the business because yeah. I love it and I yeah. love it. It's just where I felt most comfortable. So yeah. I think my advice would be when you go into this second store is be the face, but not from day one, work out how it can run without you. Yeah. yeah. And then the third and the fourth will become a lot easier. But if you find yourself setting it up and working in the second one, you're in for that extra six months to get out. So what the boys are telling us, and I include Benji Costa's takeaway owner in this assessment, is that they, like many business owners, are a little bit type A. Okay, they're control freaks, but believe me, I can relate. If this is you, you need to know that if you want more bricks and mortar venues than the number of founders in your business, then you're going to have to train your staff to replace you. That's your job, and it's what Alan Pessoa of Bowhouse Coffee has done with his four sites. He had to check his control freak tendencies at the door, or he wouldn't be staring down the barrel of the future major expansion of his business. Here's Alan. Even though I had a plan to expand and all, I didn't quite knew exactly what to do. So I got I got it going. I was going to move there myself and work there and overlook the other shop, right? But I did find experienced manager and uh, he helped me a lot. When you start opening other shops, you can use uh, more experienced people from your other cafes to bring it in. Because uh, the boys are there too, it would be much easier for them. <laughs> because <laughs> then they can send the other one there. After the second one, and I had people running one shop and I had a manager on the other one, I was already able just to come in, make sure everything was right, do a bit of customer service at peak hours, and connect with uh, the customers and the locals, and then let them do their job. It sounds like you're making use of your staff across venues. Is it just automatic and easy opening a new venue now? If you open a new venue and you get busy and the people are going to come in, the first impression they have, they don't actually understand that you're under a lot of pressure. And even for you, like if I open a new coffee shop and it's a new bow house, although I know everything, you put yourself in a new venue, it's, it's hard. It's good to do like a soft opening because you got to make sure whatever you're serving is 100%. So I do, I would take one of the stuff that know the menu, Oh, they'll put them there taking orders. The most important thing is, is to keep your customers happy. Uh, everything can be forgiven, like when you're running a restaurant, like if you r run out of something that people like. But if you know how to deal with your customers and you're close with them, they will, they'll, get, they'll get you, you know, they'll forgive you. Alan has some sound advice. Use the staff you've got and build on what you're doing well in your first venue. As for the boys at Pasta Prego, they don't need any lessons on building staff loyalty. And that's something with our, our second store, 
I was like, oh, I'm not going to be able to work in here. Saw that really quickly. And in the first two, three weeks, it was like, yeah, yeah. I need to plan an exit really quickly. Yeah. Stepping away from the business is it's very difficult. It's very difficult. But you need, like you said, you need the right people in place. I think hiring just good people with the same type of culture and understanding your level of passion and just being honest, I think, with your employees is uh, yeah. sometimes tough. But <laughs> yeah, walk away and show them that you trust yeah. them. Another thing is just like the way we used to train staff versus the way we train staff now, I think really has reduced the time in which they become competent and confident in their own ability. I would say like we've really tried to make everything like really visual and right in front of your face. And like, this is how you do this. This is how you do this. And I think they respond a lot better to that. And then just like really coaching them there every step of the way and becoming like really nitpicky at these things. And I know it is frustrating for them because they're like, like when they're 80% there, Lorenzo and I start to get really picky on the things that like to get them to the 100% and it's frustrating for them. But then I think like when they come out the other side, they like look back and they're like, oh, we actually did need that. And now like they're fine on their own. And when they gain that extra bit of responsibility, I think they really do start to enjoy it more. They flourish. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like you really see it come out in their personalities as well. I feel like obviously it takes someone a while to warm up. And one thing Lorenzo and I do is always try and make our staff like as comfortable as possible and like them just to be the person they are at work and you really see when they become more comfortable in their own work like their personality really does flourish and come out and mm-hmm. i think they really do then start to appreciate and love working at the workplace yeah and benji what do you think about that you know you're a couple of steps ahead of these guys they're very passionate and uh, the micromanaging sounds that 20 <laughs> percent, but i get it like <laughs> yeah it's definitely that These two have copped some grief over some dodgy measurements, but in a crucial way, Isaac and Lorenzo have been very smart. Instead of investing in big buys early, they've held back to wait and see. It means that they're nimble enough to be responsive with the day-to-day needs until you figure out what you really need to lean on. That has meant that if they do make a mistake, it's not hard to undo because they haven't committed to a two-year contract with a particular supplier of some ingredient or items they just don't need. Do you work in the business at all? Yeah, I love to. Yeah, yeah. Whenever I have opportunities, yeah. I just feel like that's where I learn most about the business. Yeah. I remember you have stores and you've got store managers and you've got the store chefs. You know, they, they all protect yeah. each other. <laughs> Perfect. Or, um, they're a tight-knit group. So you've got to go in and see what's what's going on. And I think you've got to lead from the front as well, man. Like you've got to go in and show them that you can make pasta, you can make a sandwich, you yeah. can make coffee, you can do it all. You get yeah. in the trenches we- with them and they appreciate it more. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love doing the worst cleaning yeah. tasks just to set the priest in that none of us are above it like we are Definitely. just at the same level as everyone else so it's just like yep yeah, right, except I'll that later that. on down the line and you'll know is that if you see the boss cleaning the range hood <laughs> there's an issue yeah there's an issue. The range hood's there's a that it's, it's the rage cleaning of the range yeah. hood yeah. is um is definitely a demonstration of you can't <laughs> do you can't do this job i'm i'm gonna do it yeah. <laughs> we've already palmed that one we've palmed that one <laughs> we, we got rid of that one early. the oily that's hair right. nah, nah, that's yeah. right. you're that's like right. standing up there and copping the hair nah I'm done. I'm out. <laughs> This podcast is thanks to Square. Square's magic goes beyond just taking payments. It's your point of sale, digital tickets, online orders and reporting all in one. If you'd like to see some more examples of businesses overcoming these and other issues, head to Square's publication, The Bottom Line, at square.com slash get slash the bottom line. Are you starting to accrue those, you know, those gold employees that become part of that growth structure so far yeah we've we found a couple yeah. diamonds in the rough i'd say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. um, we've like spoken about our plans with them mm. and being very transparent i think that's the one thing we do really well is that we're very transparent with our staff with stuff like that we don't hide it it's like you know we want them to be part of the journey with us mm. especially you know the people who want to make it more of a career because a lot of our staff are university students where it's that flexibility works for us and them mm. being transparent and getting them on board and making sure getting they're them emotionally involved in <laughs> your business. One of our manager currently, Grace, sometimes I feel like she cares more than both of us. Yeah. One of our other like potential managers as well on his ninth day, got a pasta prayer, got tattoo on no his arm. He way. loves it that much. Yeah. So. And we don't have our tats yet. Does so. that mean free pasta for that life? That's the agreement. Yeah. So yeah. we said, yeah. 
get one of the logo. I'll give you a free pasta. He's like, done. Now you're going essentially from surviving to structuring the business with this second premises. Aside from the the advice that Benji's given so far, you mentioned obviously, and we've talked about prep being super important. Do you have any prep specific questions in terms of this production kitchen versus second premises balance? Well, that's a hard one. So like, how did you choose what you wanted to like prep in your prep store? Was it because obviously what we wanted to do, we were talking about like our source making whatever centralized we can to make it as consistent as possible. Yeah. How did you like nitpick the things you wanted to keep on premises versus prep yeah. kitchen? Yeah, it's it's forever evolving because we'll be like, okay, this works like this right now. We then get better at other things and then create space to think about, oh, we can actually make that work there. Um, but picking and choosing, I think it's for us, the way we structure is our group chef is in the prep kitchen. Yeah. So the most important things, because, you know, it's not very easy to find a very good chefs everywhere. Yeah. And with this type style of business, you know, you, you guys understand. Yeah. The most important things I think need to be done in production because of the consistency. That person, obviously, I think would have to be the person you have most trust for, or if that is yourselves. Your key five need to be done in yeah. production, I yeah. think. Yeah. There's less room for error. So what does Benji mean by key five? If you're preparing fresh meals daily, your key five are the ingredients you use most. It might be shredded cheese, diced onions, you get the idea. I notice when I go to fish bowls, Mm -hmm. when they run out of onion, they'll just like pour a vacuum sealed bag in. So I'm like, okay, you're prepping that. That's Mm -hmm. not getting done on a store level. We're not at that point where we're like, oh, we can get onion sliced, even if we have a slicer. Everything done. But it's like, you know, trying to find that nice balance. Like, Like you said, the transport costs. You know, we're not going to be driving around all day. So there's some really good fruit and veg suppliers that offer you, you know, chops, fruit and veg, and that can actually be act almost like your prep kitchen. It is very yeah. expensive. Though. Yeah. In terms of like choosing the equipment to go in your prep kitchen, did you kind of note down like the five most important things you were going to prep there and then get the equipment you required there in that prep mm-hmm. kitchen? Wow, the prep kitchen was bare shell and we worked it out as we went. We yeah. didn't treat it like a restaurant. I was like, we needed this because things have, things That's just change yeah. so quickly because we're like, oh, actually, you know what? We don't need to do this here. We can actually do that there. So we kept it very bare minimal. We actually did it all bench top equipment, stainless steel benches. Yeah. And then it's taken us, you know, a couple of group chefs and a couple of of the right people to come in and be like, okay, we now know where we're at because it's a prep kitchen and I just didn't want to commit to something straight yeah. away where we're unsure and we're still evolving. Yeah, I guess that makes sense because even like operationally every single day we're so fluid, like we'll change something like, I guess minor for us, but then like it makes a huge difference, maybe like every two weeks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I say like I print off all the checklists because I'm very like list driven, like okay, everyone else have this done for pack up and I'm forever getting a permanent marker and adding to that yeah. checklist. Oh, yeah. oh, cross this out. Oh wait, we're doing this now. The Pasta Pogo boys spend their Friday nights at work and they wouldn't have it any other way. They pump up the tunes and have a party as they cook. Nick Connellan, the editor of Broadsheet Australia, says staff vibes are just as important for diners. And I think that's a really underrated part of going to a restaurant. Is it fun? Is it a vibrant place? Is the crowd good? What I've seen over the years as well is that the crowd at a restaurant is often really reflective of the people who run the restaurant. Staff culture is one thing, staff cost is another. Here's Alan from Bowhouse again with a tip on how to reduce staff hours while maintaining the quality of your products. I can give you one of the tips that I use on my business, which is keep it simple. I always search out there for people that can provide me with something they can do better than I could if I did it on site, because that's going to save me a lot of time, um, money that I would pay for staff to get it done for me and make your life a lot easier. Yeah, I think that's a a really smart way to do it. If you can't do everything from scratch at the beginning, being smart about making those choices and then layering your brand and your IP over the top of that to create something that is still your own thing. 
yeah. at the end of the day is a very cool way to go about it. Exactly right. Like Lorenzo said, yeah, you can't really replicate that. So someone else's like Italian pork and fennel sausage is going to be different to ours because we have our recipe that works for us. Thank and you to the Verano family. That yeah. My family did not contribute to that one. So <laughs> yeah, thanks, that was mine on us and my dad's, dad's recipe, yeah. which he loves. I was also going to ask Benji, sorry to pull back on the other question before, with the prep kitchen that you guys have, is that also a storefront or that's like a pure ghost kitchen that's... Yeah, good question. That was something we took time on um, and we didn't, that's why we made work where we were for a while, Mm -hmm. but I just saw value in having a storefront with a prep kitchen at the back Yeah, because then it slows down my travel time. So we've got head office production and a storefront i think it's cool to have a you know little hq and and, you know that's where you guys or the hq is based why not have a storefront but i just think it's cool having something where hq is now with this upcoming second shop um, you're potentially looking at repeating some of the teething issues that you had with your first shop when you're thinking about that what were some of those initial you know big problems and are any problems still unresolved in your business oh there definitely are like i think we are adapt or die people. So we're always going to have problems. We know that. And we're always going to be trying to solve them. And then a new problem will come up. I feel like we get one problem solved and we gain two new ones. So yeah. it's normal business for everyone, I guess. I think for us, it's just getting the right staff back in and stuff like that, getting the culture right again and making sure that translates between the two stores. So we're already training staff up. So when they do translate across to the new store, It will be a smoother transition. It won't be perfect. We're well aware of that, but that'll make it a lot easier for us. See you guys soon in Melbourne. Yeah, hopefully. It'd be great to chat as well. Definitely. 100%. Benji, I've got to ask with the beard, how long did that take? How long did it take? Yeah, because I'm 25 and this is 25 years. Yeah. I hey, I'm going to send you a photo. I think it, I didn't start getting a beard till I was like 22, 23. I'm not sure. <laughs> Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. No, good luck, guys. All the best. Thank you, man. Thank you, you too. Benji. Ciao. Benji. Take care. See you later. Lorenzo and Isaac, what's the first thing you're going to do after this chat? We've got a catering order. We've got a catering order. order that we have to get out. So, <laughs> but we're going to run into shopping. Get in the car and chat yeah. and say how much of a great experience was to get to know you and the other guys and how much we really got out of it. Amazing. Well, look, it's uh, it's been a pleasure chatting to you at this stage in your business. You have such a bright future ahead of you. I can't wait to see what you do. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. up next on Cool Room Confessional. True. It is a bit daunting, like opening two at once. I think I'm going to be all right. You know, ask me again in like 10 weeks, we open the sandwich shop. One statement that you just said, I think we're going to be all right, kind of worries me. This podcast is thanks to Square. Hospitality has enough on their plate. Square builds business tools that help hospo businesses like yours run smoothly. It's more than just payments, from table layouts to a digital ticketing system for your kitchen. It's all integrated and it all talks to each other because service still matters. Find out more at square.com slash my slash coolroom. We are proudly supported by American Express. Did you know that Square sellers automatically accept American Express for the same low rate as all other cards? Let American Express card members know that you support their payment method of choice with Square. Get your complimentary signage and supplies at amexpop.com slash square to help you attract more customers. Catering order. Awesome. Yeah. How Thank big you. is the catering order? Oh, just 40. So we did 140 yesterday, so that was a bit of a... Yeah, that's but. an early start, that one, <laughs> but it's fine. <laughs>